Welcome to an NJ Spotlight Conference, Building a Sustainable Infrastructure After Superstorm Sandy. This program took place on Friday, June 14th, 2013 in Trenton, New Jersey. This program is brought to you by New Jersey American Water, AEA, Energenic, PSENG, Veolia Energy, and Clean Energy Ventures. In this program, the first panel, New Jersey's Aging Water Infrastructure. The panelists are Michelle Sikirka, Assistant Commissioner of the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. Robert Huey, a member of the leadership group of Facing Our Future. Richard Dovey, President of the Atlantic County Utilities Authority. Stephen Schmidt, Vice President of Operations for New Jersey American Water Company. Moderating the program is Tom Johnson, Energy and Environment Editor for NJ Spotlight. Here to introduce the program is John Mooney, Editor-in-Chief and Co-Founder of NJ Spotlight. Hello everyone, welcome. Uh, my name is John Mooney, I'm Founding Editor of NJ Spotlight and um, thank you very much for coming to what is our, our first all-day conference. Uh, this one on obviously an important topic of building sustainable infrastructure in the aftermath of Sandy. Uh, we thought to get you all in the mood we'd have a little lively weather today, um, but, but fortunately that has held off at least for now and it's actually turned out to be a, a, a nice day. Um, and should be a really interesting and informative panel um, and panels uh, and, and round of discussion on, on some really critical topics with really the folks who know this, know these issues as, as well as any in the state. Um, so we're very fortunate about that. Um, before we get to that, I want to do a little um, shameless uh, self-promotion for NJ Spotlight. Uh, a couple weeks ago, first of all, uh, NJ Spotlight celebrated its third birthday, um, something we're, we're pretty proud of. Uh, thank you. Not, not sure something that we all thought we'd get to either, so it's a, a bit of a relief as well. It's, it's certainly been a wild ride. Uh, when we started this, this venture, um, just a few of us, uh, we, we wondered if there was going to be enough news to, to fill our site every day on the issues we cover of education, healthcare, and public finance, and of course energy and environment. And now we've gotten to a point that we wonder if we have enough reporters to cover all the news. It's, it's been an incredible uh, time for these issues. I, I think we've, we've done a, uh, a nice job in, in, in carving out a new, niche, a new niche for ourselves in this new media landscape. Um, and, and trying to be innovative in, in some of the things we do. It's, it's, it's a you know, steep learning curve for all of us, and I think it's uh, one that I think benefits the state to, to, to have this issue of public media uh, sort itself out. Um, one of the latest projects we're doing that I, we wanted to share with you is we're working with WNYC and New Jersey Public Radio um, in, in funding and, and hosting a, a reporter who's gonna work for both of us covering some of the bigger issues, enterprise stories around Sandy who's going to do both uh, radio and print. Uh, it's, it's unusual, it's dual platform. Uh, not many have tried this, and I think it's going to be an exciting, it's funded through a bunch of foundations, some of which are here today, um, and, and it's going to be great. His name is Scott Gurian, I think we'll be here today if he's not already, and uh, there he is, he's up in the back, so um, feel free to go say hi, um, and it's, it's, it's going to be a really uh, cool project, and I look forward to it. Um, also bringing us today as we continue our efforts, which are really critical to our mission of holding these public discussions across the state. Uh, we've held 20 roundtables, close to 20. I've lost count on all kinds of issues from charter schools to teacher quality to you know, Medicaid expansion. Uh, obviously, Tom has, has hosted a bunch of around energy and environmental issues. Um, and it's really, I think, added an important public uh, discussion to the state. And, and I appreciate a, a, a few of you folks have been to a few of them, and, and we appreciate you coming and, and continuing to come. This is something special. Uh, this is our first time doing an all-day event, uh, obviously worthy of the topic. It's, uh, you know, it's a big deal for us to do something like this. And, and we really appreciate not just the, the panelists and especially Governor Florio for, for being with us today, 
um, but also all of you uh, for being part of it. It really means a lot, for, a, a lot to us for you to have that faith in, in our sessions as being a, a good way to spend your day, and, and we thank you very much. Uh, we also most certainly want to thank the sponsors uh, who made this possible um, and, and really helped make NJ Spotlight possible. And, um, and I will uh, list them and, and give a big shout out to New Jersey American Water, uh, the, Ameri uh, the Association of Environmental Authorities, Energenic, PSENG, uh, Veolia Energy, and Clean Energy Futures. But please give a round of applause to our sponsors. Now, a couple, um, some, some uh, logistics on this. Each session is gonna go for about an hour, hour and a half. Uh, we're going to have some time uh, at the end for some questions from the audience, and, and there'll be a mic that uh, we'll be walking around and sort of catch our attention. I'll, we'll, uh, we'll announce that's going to happen. There's also some index cards on your tables. If you feel more comfortable doing it that way, write it down. Look for us again on the outskirts, and we'll get the questions up to Tom uh, to, to uh, pose and, and integrate into the, into the panel discussion. Uh, I'm told there's no vending machines in this place, uh, thanks to your state government, um, so don't go looking for them. Um, but there are bathrooms, so those, there are bathrooms in the, on this floor and then also downstairs. Uh, we also very much appreciate you guys giving us some feedback, especially on an event like this, which is uh, new for us. Um, and we will on Monday or Tuesday be sending, we usually do it by paper, we're gonna be doing it electronically this time, and we'll be sending you all an email, which we really implore you, please take a little time to fill out the survey and, and let us know how we did on some specific questions because it really helps us improve on it. So, uh, last but not least, I wanna introduce the star of the show, um, and this is Tom Johnson, many of you know him. Uh, he's a longtime reporter in the state on issues of energy and environment, uh, for close to 20 years, worked together at the Star-Ledger. Um, but 20 years is nothing compared to, now he's got the task of hosting three panels today. Um, so he's gonna win some special awards for that. So uh, please join me in welcoming Tom Johnson and our first panel. Thanks, John. Um, welcome, everybody. And uh, thanks to the panelists for uh, agreeing to participate on it. And we, uh, I'm sure we're going to have a fantastic discussion today. First off, uh, let me introduce uh, Michelle Sakurka, Assistant Commissioner at the Department of Environmental Protection. I'm sure most of you know her. She's a, this, her second Assistant Commissionership at the Department. And, She's got a lot on her plate following Sandy and Michelle. Thanks, Tom. Hi, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to join you this morning and talk about what we have going on in our post-Sandy world here in New Jersey relative to infrastructure. I always like to start with where we were on October 28th because we, we were working on an awful lot of exciting things at that time in, in my water world. Uh, right now I'm the Assistant Commissioner for Water Resource Management and as I explain it or when my mother asks me, what is it that you do, I say if it's wet and it's in the state of New Jersey, I've got it. So great time to be in water right now. Um, but right before the storm came, things we were working on, we were very focused on asset management and we had an awesome white paper that we were getting ready to roll out and we had pilot projects that we were getting ready to line up and we were working on issues around combined sewer overflow which is huge around our state of New Jersey, something we've been trying to get our arms around. We've been working on comprehensive water resource management. How do we take a, a focus on water in the state dealing with the stressors on our water and how we ensure we have iterative, positive impact on our water each year, not just always trying to, as I say, eat the elephant all at one time, which we can't do on setting standards that we could never possibly meet. So we had all this exciting stuff going on um, just in those days pre-Sandy. And then, of course, on October 29th, you know, Sandy joined us in the state of New Jersey. And while Sandy was very devastating in her own right, what she did do is she exposed our vulnerabilities, but at the same time she confirmed the direction that we were proceeding in from our corner of the world. It reaffirmed our priorities around stressors on our water like CSOs, infiltration and inflow, the need for asset management, better operation and maintenance, emergency response planning, and how we deal with stormwater throughout the state. 
Just to give you a snapshot of our damage assessment post Sandy, and many of you have read this and heard this, but just to put us in perspective and set the tone for the day, we experienced just shy of $3 billion, $3 billion of impact on our water structures. And when I talk about water structures today, I'm talking about it from both the water supply side, drinking water side, as well as our wastewater side and storm water. That $3 billion equates to about 370 separate projects around the state of New Jersey. And just to break it down a little more, in recoveries, so that's the immediate, you know, how do we get our system back up and running to permit limits? Um, and in some regards, it's still, as I call, Band-Aid and bubble gums. We have, you know, systems working on on manual systems right now, as opposed to they're automated as they recover. But recovery, those immediate after effects, uh, about $350 million of, of funds in that area. Repair, this is how we rebuild going forward in the state. And this rebuild is just to where we were before. That's another half a billion dollars. And then resiliency. When we rebuild, how do we do it better so that we're prepared for, God forbid, another Sandy that comes our way? $1.7 billion. That's what makes up that almost $3 billion in terms of the things that we need around the state of New Jersey to get us where we want to be. Sandy certainly gave us lessons learned. We learned about where we need um, better information around our resources and data so that we could be better in our immediate response. We absolutely had issues around role definition, and you know the thing we talk about all the time is this event um, became one of, of energy needs. And around the state, when you have all of your waste treatment facilities off the grid, it creates a whole new challenge, and it redefines how we react. You know, all the time, the first place we always are is, what's the impact on the water? We're out there monitoring to see if we have um, overflows, how that's impacting. Here, our primary concern was getting our systems back on the grid. And certainly, communication was key. You know, the vulnerabilities that we saw through Sandy was power loss, flooding, obviously, infrastructure damage. My biggest concern going forward, a primary th threat that we can't ignore is a business as usual mentality. This is a new paradigm and we need to think of things very different. And another aspect that we have very challenging, of course, is the fiscal impact that goes along with all of this. On the power side, I mentioned, you know, we had majority, vast majority of our, of our systems off the grid. In our rebuild, we need to set standards that help our systems to understand what we mean in our rules when we say continuous operation. In the past, it may have been good enough to say that we can sustain being off the grid for 3 to 12 hours. We have a new norm now, and we have to be very practical on how we approach that because we cannot expect our systems to just bring a boatload of fuel and a massive amount of generators you know, and have them on site all the time. That creates whole new challenges. We always have to be careful of what the unintended consequences of our actions are and how we may trigger you know, other environmental concerns. And so on the power side, we're taking a very comprehensive approach and we're looking regionally at how we can approach resiliency for our systems, but not just our systems alone, our sister systems where they're in a region with other critical infrastructure. Currently, we're doing some heat maps around the state where we're taking different aspects of critical infrastructure, water infrastructure, transportation, energy, hospitals, communication centers. We're mapping them to see where there may be tremendous new opportunities for new distributive generation, things that will be discussed later today. Flood impacts. We also have to help our systems as they rebuild to understand you know, how can they avoid and what are they going to be subject to in the future relative to this new type of flooding? You know, this wasn't the typical, more typical for us is an Irene type storm where we're just deluged with water coming down and where, you know, we, because of our massive growth in the state of New Jersey and our lack of impervious surface, the water can't go anywhere. You know, this was a whole new paradigm where you have 15 foot wall a surge of water overtake an entire treatment facility like PVSC up in Newark or the um, Middlesex County Utilities Authority um, down in um, Sayreville. You know, when you have a situation like that, that's not something you tend to plan for every day. So in the rebuild, we have to think about things of elevation. What can you elevate? What is practical in the water world to elevate? Because water, everything's about gravity, right? So, you know, how do we ensure that those motor control devices that run the systems are out of harm's way? How do we ensure that facilities are better out of harm's way going forward? But where we can't elevate or where we can't move, we need to think about how do we flood protect in terms of dry flooding? How do we make more resilient the building, the box, the structure around it? You know, is it the right opportunity for a flood wall, but then what does a flood wall do for the rest of the community around that facility? These are all the different types of opportunities that we're looking at in partnership with our systems. And we are doing a lot of hand-holding right now and a lot of facilitating 
Our goal through this rebuild is to be a partner to our facilities and to bring them the resources they need. So right now, we're conducting meetings every day with our facilities where we bring to the table our federal partners, whether it's FEMA, Army Corps, um, DCA, anybody who has money, anyone who can help them. But we need to understand how we get them a pathway forward and how we make sure that embedded in all of their repair are additional projects that are for resiliency and that we make sure that those resiliency projects are funded through FEMA under their 406 public assistance. So on the resiliency side and asset management, I want to give you a snapshot of what our assets look like in the state of New Jersey and how Sandy does provide us for this new opportunity. We have 31 investor-owned utilities serving 40% of the state um, relative to our, to our water assets. 620 publicly, public community water systems for drinking water. That's our drinking water side. 300 of those are municipally owned. We have 260 community wastewater si systems. 60% of those are publicly owned. So we, we have a, you can see that you know, there is a um, divergence between public and private. On the water supply side, we have some of our largest utilities in the state that serve most of our population in many different ways. On our wastewater side, uh, we have the vast amount of our facilities that are publicly owned, and that brings a whole new challenge. And stormwater throughout the entire state is managed municipally. We have many challenges when we confront asset management in the state of New Jersey. As we know, we do have antiquated and failing systems. We have unknown and unmapped buried infrastructure. You know, this is a challenge for us. We have hidden assets all over the state, and we don't have a good handle on where they are and the level of criticality and how they would help us to be more resilient. We have a lack of unified funding and regulatory requirements in the state. So DEP, we have regulatory authority over those public systems, and we set the environmental standards and rules and codes. BPU is the ratepayer and oversees the private facilities. And then DCA at the local level looks at the, the opportunities for, for budget and the constraints on local budget in order to fund projects. So it's very important that we work together as sister agencies on any type of strategy. And that white paper that I was discussing that we had ready to fly on October 28th takes into consideration that partnership, those three agencies working together, as well as working with DOT. Because think about it, when DOT is, um, has a capital improvement plan to open up roads, isn't it great that we see what's under those roads at that time? This is the idea of being comprehensive in our approach. Some other concerns or challenges we have is we absolutely have declining federal assistance in our regular base programs from year to year. We have the state revolving fund in the state of New Jersey that helps to support our ability to invest in infrastructure in the state of New Jersey. We're very fortunate in New Jersey that we're able to leverage those state revolving funds that we get from the federal government through our New Jersey State Environmental Infrastructure Trust Fund. And what that does is it takes those, those funds, it takes those monies, and it turns it into a bonding program where we can go out and leverage those dollars two, three, four times. And the blended rate of the interest, because we can come in, the state can provide 0% interest, and then the EIT can go out and bond and we can blend the rate, and now we've been able to create a very, very low interest rate for our water facilities in order for them to improve their infrastructure. But those regular federal dollars are, are declining. We're very fortunate that we got a special appropriation from the federal government through the Sandy legislation that will bring about $250 million to the state of New Jersey for purposes of Sandy repair. And we're writing that program right now. We know that we've been rated C's, D's, D plus in terms of our infrastructure in the state of New Jersey. Um, we're certainly not proud of that, and we're you know, very much looking forward to bringing that up to uh, a, better, a better grade. Personally, myself, I, I tend to like A's. I have kids in college, and I don't like when they come home with C's and D's, for sure. Um, but it has been estimated that we have $45 billion of need over the next 20 to 25 years. That was a U.S. EPA survey that was conducted back in 2007. That hasn't changed. It's only gotten worse. It's about $8 billion for drinking water projects and about $37 billion on our wastewater and stormwater side. So what does the strategy look like? How do we get there? We need new policy. We need excellent planning, long-term planning. And we need potentially some legislative and regulatory changes, and that's what we're looking at right now. This key of working together across agencies is significantly important, and we have to recognize that one size doesn't fit all around the state. We need to take a regional approach. We need to look at how systems integrate with each other. 
We need to get municipalities and utility authorities and private and public sector all working together on this. You know, New Jersey's infrastructure, the way we're set up because of our home rule and our local ownership of our assets makes it very challenging to take on comprehensive projects. This is one where we really all have to get on the same page and, and work together. And we were looking to select some pilot utility systems in order to try some of these programs to see how we could find ways to best invest for asset management going forward. Couple key things, the elements of a good asset management plan, infrastructure inventory and condition assessment. This is key. Right now in the state of New Jersey, we need to get our arms around our inventory and the condition of our assets. The next piece of it is the level of service goals. What is required of that asset? What is its level of service? Who is it servicing? We need to do criticality analysis and risk assessment. We need to understand that while we have infrastructure all across the state, there's an identification that certain of that infrastructure is much more critical than other when it comes to, on the water supply side, for example, having a, um, a trunk line that goes down and being able to interconnect the system in another way so that we can keep water flowing to those who need it. Obviously, we need a funding plan to go along with it, and then it's all in the execution and implementation. So this is the direction we're going when we talk about, you know, key sister agencies to have around the table. I mentioned some, but there are others as well. The Office of Planning Advocacy has been at our table. The EDA has been at our table. Um, we've also been partnering with our, with our federal agencies, uh, the U.S. Housing and Urban Development, and EPA, and of course the Army Corps of Engineers. And when we talk about asset management, we think of pipes, we think of the great pipes, and we think of them in the ground. But, you know, there's other, other issues that impact the pipes as well, stressors on those pipes. Around the state, we have issues around infiltration and inflow, and that works in two different ways when it comes to drinking water or wastewater. On the drinking water side, the last thing you want is this quality asset, this commodity of your fresh water that's coming to all of us leaking out of pipes and we're losing the benefit of it. So our ability to have pipes that are tightened up keeps that commodity where it is and keeps the cost down and gets it flowing directly and we're not just losing it out of the pipe. On the wastewater side, what happens is with our leaky pipes when we have holes in our pipes is now we have inflow into those pipes and it's causing tremendous stressors on our treatment works facilities. So where their average capacity might be one number, they have this excess flow coming in because of the leaky pipes. It's causing them to expand their capacity to take on water that shouldn't be coming in. So we can save tremendous amounts of money and resource when we take a good asset management plan and we, we get rid of our leaky pipes. And the other piece of this, too, is um, where green infrastructure fits in. Gray infrastructure is you know, very expensive, but a right strategy over the course of 20 to 25 years, I always say to folks, it's just like having a car. Right? Your car lasts longer if you change your oil every 3,000 or 5,000 miles. You change the tires every 10,000 miles, unless you're a driver like me. I seem to have to change my tires much more often. But um, when we take care of our asset, it lasts longer for us. It's the same in water infrastructure. If we tend to our asset with good operation and maintenance, if we have a 20-year plan on how we're going to replace pieces of those assets over time, it becomes much more manageable and much more affordable. And those are the long-term plans that we're looking for. And our hope is that through Sandy and the, the, the post-Sandy money that has come to the state of New Jersey, that we can see some of that money flow to long-term asset management in our water utilities area. Thank you very much. I know we have Q&A later. Thanks, Michelle. Um, our next spe speaker is Bob Huey. He's served under both Governor Tom Kane and Governor Florio. Um, and he, uh, met, Michelle mentioned the Environmental Infrastructure Trust, and we, uh, we have Bob Huey to thank for its creation. Bob? Hi, everybody. Governor? Um, I'm with a group called Facing Our Future, which uh, is, is in the midst of actually in, in April released our third report. Now, Facing Our Future is a nonpartisan, uh, nonprofit group that was formed about four years ago, and I, I like to call it a bunch of old people. Uh, and what, what we were is a, a group of old commissioners, uh, judges, budget directors and treasurers that work for administrations through the last 30 years in New Jersey. And we got together under a group called New Jersey Grant Makers to look at some issues that affected the state uh, in a way that 
sometimes government can't do. And the first two reports that we did uh, took a look at the difference between revenues and expenses throughout all forms of government uh, in New Jersey over the next five years. That was two and a half years ago. And what we found, which probably won't surprise many of you that, that deal with government on a, on a regular basis, is that there is a 20 percent gap between revenues and expenses across all those levels going out at least five years and probably much longer. Now, that, that's a big gap when you think about it. You know, in the old days when we were trying to make up budget deficits, we used to go, well, we'll take 5 percent from this guy and 5 percent from that guy and we'll, we'll make it through another year. And we, you know, government is very good at doing that. When you start to talk about 20 percent, that's a big reach. And, and then you have to talk about how do we deliver services, what kind of services do we want in the state, and how are we going to pay for them. Uh, we did two of those reports, and, and for those of you who haven't seen them, uh, they're available on facingourfuture.com, uh, .org, I'm sorry. Uh, and, I, and I would recommend them. I think it, it gives you a, a, a really good view of the state, where we are and what we can afford and what we can't afford. For our third report, we decided we were going to look at infrastructure uh, for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is hasn't, hasn't been looked at in a comprehensive way for a long, long time in the state of New Jersey. And we felt that there was probably a pretty big gap between what we need and what we have. And that proved to be the case. Uh, we looked at transportation, electricity, and water supply. Today I'm going to talk about water supply, but I, trust me when I tell you that, as you, I think there are copies of that report here, uh, but the full report is again on facing our future. The gaps are huge in transportation, in what we need to provide uh, in electricity, and in water supply. Now, Michelle gave the numbers, and, and you know, it's, it's interesting. You, you can get really confused about these numbers. You know, the, everybody's got a different set of numbers. But it's, it's clearly over $40 billion for water systems. Uh, I'm going to let Rick Dovey, who's going to follow me today, uh, talk about wastewater. but. In terms of stormwater management and w drinking water, we, we've got a gap of $25 billion. And it reminds me, for those of you who've been around a long time, we used to have a senator in, this, in the federal government called Ed Edward Dirksen. <laughs> and he was a very funny guy and knew a lot about budgets uh, and was a little cynical. And his, one of his famous quotes was, a million here, a million there, pretty soon it adds up to real money. Well, now we're talking billions. So if I say to you it's four, $9 billion for our water system, our water supply system, uh, and it's $15 billion for stormwater management, and that doesn't include spending the money that it takes to provide to protect our watersheds, you understand that we've, we've got a pretty big gap in this state. And every year we don't address it, it becomes more expensive. Michelle gave you the number from the 2007 report of EPA, which is 7.96, I believe, billion dollars. Uh, but the 2000 report, 2004 report, be between 2004 and 2007, the number went up 137 percent. Well, why is that? <laughs> it's obvious. It's, the longer we put off maintenance in this state, the longer we, do, we put off reinvestment, the more expensive it becomes. So where are we and where do we have to go? We can have a lot of plans. I mean, I think uh, the, the planning that Michelle outlined, are, they're all necessary. They're all good. Uh, and in the midst of our report, of course, we had Sandy, which is sort of, it hasn't changed any number in our report, except it's drawn attention to the need. You know, infrastructure went out of vogue for a number of years. Now we're reminded that these are important things to address. Uh, that doesn't mean we're going to address them, does it? Because to get to that next step, we've got to say, how are we going to do it? How are we going to pay for it? And that, that's a very unpopular topic. 
You know, I think for years, there are, there are a number of different ways to take reports like the one we put together, particularly from, for, from a governmental perspective. You can take it and say, this is the cover we needed to address the issue. We have a, a strong demand for new resources. A group like this will put out a report and say, in order to address those needs, you have to pay more. Or you can say, it's a good report, but we don't want to pay more. And, and I think more and more common in today's age is the second response. You know, acknowledging that we need to, to, to pay for these things is to mean we might have to have a strategy for how we pay for them. That, that makes people uncomfortable. But it shouldn't. The things we're talking about in our report, transportation, water supply, there's a way to pay for them. And we should be doing it. Water is one of the best bargains in the world. I mean, there's not a person in this room that about five times a week doesn't get a bottle of water at a Wawa when they're going somewhere in the afternoon. If you spent that same amount of money at home, you'd be buying gallons of water. There's not a person in this room that doesn't buy a Starbucks coffee at least once a week when you're taking a trip. Put that same money into a gas tax and we solve a major part of our problem. Now that, that's how small the solution is, except we don't want to step up and say this is the solution. So I would submit to you that we do need good plans in this state. And, and there's some planning that hasn't been done for years. And it's not a criticism of Michelle or her department, but the water supply master plan hasn't been updated in a very long time. And that, you have to have that plan in place so that other people, counties and municipalities, have a thing to plan to. So I would submit that we have to update all our plans. We ought to do that before we ask people for more money, but we also have to be prepared to pay the price. And I would, I would tell you that this is not just an environmental issue. I mean, it, clearly that's important to me, but it's an economic development issue. A state that does not reinvest in itself is not gonna be successful 20 years from now. I don't care what the number is. And so, you know, I guess in a way, my message is the bad news message today. We have a lot of needs. We know what those needs are. The question is, are we gonna pay for them? Thank you. Thanks, Bob. That was uh, very uh, insightful. Um, I guess next up is Rick Dovey from the Atlanta County Municipal uh, Utilities Authority. They're doing a lot of wonderful things down there. And he'll give you his perspective on the infrastructure needs. Good morning. Uh, I'm uh, the head of the Atlantic County Utilities Authority, as, as Tom said, and you can see in the program. Uh, we're responsible for wastewater treatment uh, in, in Atlantic County in the eastern two-thirds. Uh, it was a system that was put together uh, 25, 30 years ago. Uh, and I'm, that's, that's important. That's our story. We're also responsible for solid waste. Uh, and that system was put together 25 years ago. So the meeting today is about building a sustainable infrastructure. That was the issue before Sandy, and now it's actually a, a bigger issue, and it's more challenging after Sandy. I, I'm first gonna talk about the infrastructure that manages the infrastructure. So, my other hat is uh, currently I'm serving as the uh, president of the Authorities, Environmental Authorities Association of New Jersey, which are the public agencies that are responsible for wastewater, solid waste, and water um, service in this, in this state. That infrastructure was largely put together 25, 30 years ago, matching when the ACUA. There is a system on the public sector, on the public side, and there is a system on the private side um, <clears throat> that manages these 
And you know what? By and large, they've done a pretty good job. It's become more challenging with the uh, uh, budget issues, the lack of decisions that Bob was just referring to over time at all levels of government, uh, the lack of commitment. And this sector, water, sewer, even solid waste, uh, is particularly hard to get across to the public. Our infrastructure is underground. Uh, in Atlantic City this week, a bridge connecting one side of the city to the other, which is a city bridge, uh, was closed because it's failing, causing all kinds of issues. But everybody can see that that bridge is not working and it has impacted people's lives. Our infrastructure is underground, out of sight. Earlier this week, uh, we, we had an event where we invited all of our customers. Our customers are the sewage agencies at the municipal level, uh, the Atlantic City Sewage Company, a private uh, utility, to see upgraded sewer pump station. Now, they all came because actually they understand that that's a good thing that the ACUA, through the Environmental Trust, had upgraded all its pump stations with modern technology and pumps and bypass capabilities. Uh, nobody from the media came. Whether it was the weekly, the, the daily, the local TV station, and I, I, I get that. It's not really exciting going to it. But it's important. This infrastructure, but that bridge that I talked about, that actually affected many fewer people and for a much shorter period of time than that pump station in Absecon serves one third of the county. Stockton College, the airport, Smithville, Galloway Township. If that pump station doesn't work, everything upstream from it doesn't work or is impacted. Businesses closed, the restaurants can't be served. We, we need to talk about this system more than just when they fail. It was a terrible storm that we, we had. The impact on the sewage, wastewater sewage infrastructure in this state, in the particular, in the northern coast and, in, and around Newark Bay was terrible, and into New York and into Long Island. Uh, and many people were saying, how could this happen? Uh, they must be not be running their facilities right. Sewer plants and sewer pump stations are located at the lowest point. They need to be more resilient. So I talked about before Sandy, we weren't talking about that. So that 35 million, 37 million that Bob and, and Michelle talked about in needed, in New Jersey, needed sewer, wastewater uh, uh, upgrades and improvements needed in the next 20 years did not include resiliency. Most of these facilities that needed to be upgraded before need to be upgraded in a whole different way. They need to be able to deal with storm surges. Now, in, our, in, in Atlantic City, this storm hit Atlantic City. Suppose that was the center. Our plant serving uh, roughly 200,000 people, uh, this close this close to failing, either water coming in or water going out. Uh, it would not have worked. And further north, that actually did happen. And uh, Middle, Middlesex Utilities Authority, the um, um, Sake Valley facility, and any number of other ones in Monmouth County, uh, really suffered and are still suffering, are still not fully back in operation. And one of the great vulnerabilities um, that, that was exposed and hasn't been mentioned here and I haven't really seen much in, in any of the media about it, is biosolids or, as we know, sludge in our business. That's the stuff taken out of the sewage to make it, and it's clean after that, but that has to be dealt with. That system was exposed to be the most vulnerable and at risk, there was a mad scramble to find out how to deal with wastewater sludge, biosolids, after the storm. We, we got through it, 
but it exposed that something new and different has to happen. So this, this deals with technologies, new processes, new arrangements. I'm going to back to the institution that the institutions, the institutions, utilities authorities, uh, were put into place. Most of them, most, not all, are actually regional. They are, they are not, uh, and that was a smart move because this kind of issue really needs to be deal, dealt with between several municipalities or even countywide and sometimes beyond counties, uh, over many county lines. That system is at risk, and you, you've all read about the uh, horrendous uh, examples of abuse at uh, MUAs, and, and that's always in the newspaper. Uh, uh, we have problems in every level of government uh, with bad things happening, but that's not the norm. But because of that, we are at risk. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of end one, on one last thing. This problem is critical. Both Michelle, Bob, <coughs> Steve will, will do the same. Uh, we need to address it. The storm has made it clear that we need to address it. Money is the ultimate issue. How are we going to prioritize these issues how do you get the public or the elected officials, the policy makers, to decide that money needs to be reserved uh, and put aside to upgrade and maintain these systems? The other thing that is important is asset management. And for the last several years, both the department and uh, most of the MUAs and the municipalities and the uh, private utilities are all focused on asset management. Asset management means taking care of what you have uh, planning ahead and knowing what you need to do and how much money to put aside. So let me just end with, it's so ironic that this week, well, it actually was the end of last week, that I learned of a bill introduced in both the Senate and the Assembly in the last two weeks uh, <clears throat> that would allow the county governments who oversee utility, county utilities authority to have access to all non-restricted funds. Now, a bill was put, passed eight years ago that allowed counties and municipalities to uh, have access up to 5% of our assets, non-restricted assets. In my county, that has not been an issue for the county, the, there's never even been a discussion with the county treasurer, the county executive, the county board of freeholders about ACUA, cough up your 5%. But that's taking ratepayer money that's collected for either wastewater or solid waste and putting it towards property tax expenses at the county level or the municipal level. That's been in place for eight years and it has been done both at the county level and the municipal level, on an ongoing basis. Now, the story is, well, the Utilities Authority could say no. No, you can't say no. <laughs> it's tribute. You have nothing to say about it. Uh, that's how it works. Now there's a bill to say, take the 5% cap off, and it's unrestricted. I don't know whether this is actually going to happen in the next two weeks, but nobody had a hearing, nobody had a discussion. Um, <clears throat> at the very time that we're trying to come back and deal with the, the already $37 billion uh, needs, now the added resiliency and asset management responsibilities that any prudent organization, public or private, would do for the future take the money that was paid towards wastewater, solid waste, water drink, drinking water, and divert it to general purposes at some level of government is crazy. But this may, in fact, happen. Because people don't understand, it just seems like well, we're, just, we're just moving it from you to them. I would, I would argue that utilities authorities, municipal, county, regional, have done a pretty good job in managing these assets, uh, keeping rates level, keeping their regulatory compliance uh, outstanding. And these sorts of decisions without 
like the folks in this room, without being aware that this may happen, or this is under consideration, and how short-sighted and impactful, negatively impactful, to the whole discussion that we're, we're having today. Um, it, it, we, we all just need to be aware of it. The problem, the, the one last thing I wanted to mention about is uh, Bob talked about um, stormwater. <clears throat> stormwater doesn't really have an infrastructure to manage the infrastructure. It's municipal government, <clears throat> which there is no level of government more stress financially right now. <clears throat> and stormwater is just not going to make, make the grade when you have a police department, a fire department, school issues, whatever, whatever the issues are that are ongoing and always have been there. Uh, there's nobody who's going to speak up for stormwater. But stormwater is the, uh, is the one infrastructure that needs some institutional change. And about a year and a half ago, two years ago, maybe five years ago at various times, there's been discussion of the stormwater utility law. Uh, of course, the immediate reaction from uh, some uh, <clears throat> parts of uh, our community was it's a, it's a rain tax. You can really demonize anything. But stormwater is a big problem, as anybody knew in the last couple of days. Uh, and during Sandy, during Irene, during Floyd, uh, stormwater is an issue that also needs to get on the plate, not just mentioned with a number, and we get a D in that too. I think we get an F in that, uh, actually, because it still doesn't have an institution uh, dealing with it. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. Uh we have uh, aspirin in the back for those who are getting depressed. <laughs> um, next up is Steve Schmidt. He's uh, uh, from New Jersey American Water. He's got 30 years of experience. And he's going to give us the perspective from the water supply issue. Good, good morning, everyone. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to be a little more uplifting if I, if I can. But, uh, but it is, it is a tough problem. Um, yeah, and Michelle, I, you know, I, I, I've used the car analogy a lot, but I don't know that I drive like you. I think I'd need a pit crew to be changing tires that frequently. And, uh, but anyway, a little bit more about my background. I, I uh, am a civil engineer by education and practice, 33 years of experience. As a matter of fact, it was in this very facility 25 years ago. I sat eight hours to take my professional engineer's exam. And the only thing I think has changed is slightly more comfortable chairs, it looks like. Uh, in 25 years. Um, for the past 26 years, I've worked for American Water in the field of water resources uh, and capital investment management. I've had the opportunity to oversee about $10 billion of investment in the renewal, replacement, and upgrade of, of water systems across the country. So I've lived, I've lived the issue. Um, the overall theme of today's session is utility resiliency in the wake of, of Superstorm Standy. So I'm going to touch on that subject briefly, really to, to provide some context for my more detailed comments uh, regarding the condition of the state's water, water infrastructure. Let me start. You know, as a nation, we like crucible, what we call crucible moments. September 11th, Hurricane Katrina were, were example. Here for New Jersey, uh, Superstorm Sandy is, is our crucible moment. But you, know, you don't need to have a very long memory to, to think about how extreme weather events have Placed an exist, you know, uh, put our utility infrastructure to the test. How many folks remember the December 2010 snowstorm? Day after uh, that, uh, made public news because it took New York City uh, down for four days. Well, that also had a significant impact on on uh, the coastal areas of New Jersey, uh, Monmouth and, and Ocean County. Fast forward to 2011, we got a little wake up call in, in August of 2011 with a 5.8. Uh, scale earthquake epicenter in Virginia, but it just shook us a little bit. And then days after that, we had Hurricane Irene, followed by Tropical Storm Lee, followed by the October 2011 snowstorm. The, those, those storms you know, spared the coast, but brought significant inland flooding, wind, tree damage, and extensive power, power outages. Uh, 2012, summer of 2012, I learned a new word, derecho. Never heard that word before. 
it talks about sustained straight wind storms. It had a devastating effect in Atlantic County, Cape May County, and we had extensive power outages during the hottest period of the year. Those power outages extended all the way down to the DC, the DC area. And that was all just a lead up to, to Hurricane Sandy. If you expand your geographic uh, boundaries beyond New Jersey during the same time frame and, and think about the southeast and the Midwest sections of the country, we had uh, extreme drought conditions, or actually extreme flooding conditions, followed back to back by extreme drought conditions. We had severe tornadoes in Alabama, Joplin, Missouri, and most recently Oklahoma City. Our company owns and operates the water system in Joplin, Missouri. I can tell you it's a surreal event that in one hour on a Sunday afternoon, one third of your customer base, the premises, their properties are destroyed, and their water and fire service lines are now, you know, shooting up in the air like, like geysers. It, it really focuses your attention. So as a water utility uh, practitioner and having lived, lived these events, let me share with you my thoughts on what are kind of, I think, the four things that utilities need to ensure resi long-term resiliency. The first is our essential personnel. Those are the talented men and women uh, that really place their own personal priorities and needs secondary when these types of events uh, happen and they come to work and they provide and they operate our systems and they provide service to our customers uh, during these events. We're not going to talk about that today, but, but it wouldn't happen without them. The second is what we are here to talk about, and that's our physical plant and our infrastructure, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. The third are our critical sector dependencies, critical dependencies. The first is electrical power, and that the group has, has, has covered that as well. That's closely followed by natural gas, fuel, and chemical uh, deliveries. We need those to, to operate our business. When you talk about fuel and chemicals, that brings the transportation sector in because we take delivery of fuel and chemicals primarily by rail and by truck. And the last is our telecommunications in infrastructure. Uh, water systems increasingly rely on digital equipment, on instrumentation and on automation, and it needs uh, you know, a secure and robust data and signal uh, communication from our telecommunications for those systems to work effectively. And the last item I'll mention is, and, and it's been discussed here, it, we need to have strong partnerships uh, with our key sector agencies, including uh, Michelle's team at New Jersey DEP, including the New Jersey Board of Public Utilities, who are the New Jersey Office of, of Rate Council. Uh, our state, county, and local government is important. The state police, the state office of emergency management, the county offices of emergency management, and the state and local uh, fire departments are all critical uh, during, these, uh, during these events. So while each of those areas you know, could occupy an entire, kind of an entire session, let me, let me start talking about uh, the needs of, of our physical plant and buried infrastructure in, in the water sector. The, the investment needs, and in, in my fellow panelists here have co covered it very well. They've been studied extensively. The US EPA does their needs assessment survey every four years. The American Water Works Association recently re released their report uh, entitled Buried No Longer. We talked about the American Society of Civil Engineers um, report card, and then they also did a report called Failure to Act, which specifically studied water and wastewater infrastructure and took a little twist. They identified the funding gaps, but they also identified the corresponding economic impact to ho both households, businesses, and communities if we, if we fail to invest. And, and it's... Um, you know, it's interesting, they, they projected $200 billion of investment needs over the next 20 years, but if we don't make them, there'll be $2 trillion worth of, of negative uh, economic impacts. And we've talked about the Facing Our Future uh, report, the New Jersey DEP, and the estimates uh, of investment needs here in New Jersey. So how does that translate those investment needs to, to my situation? And the reason I'll, you know, I'll kind of talk about the details of New Jersey Americans' infrastructure is I think it's a representative uh, it's representative of the water infrastructure for the state. We operate in 18 of the 21 counties and in 188 municipalities. So I think we have all sizes and, and shapes and forms of, of infrastructure. We serve 650,000 utility customers in the state, about, about 50 what we call bulk water sale or sale for resale accounts. Collectively, that represents about 2.5 million people receiving water service from New Jersey American and it's about 28% of the state's population. Across those service areas, we have about 9,000 miles of transmission and distribution main, uh, whereas my friend Frank Simpson in, in the room here pointed out that that would connect Rick's system in Atlantic City to Los Angeles 
three times over if we wanted to interconnect those. It's, it's a lot of pipe. What's the makeup of that infrastructure? 90% of that pipe is manufactured from cast iron or ductile iron, um, ferrous materials. 10% is steel, uh, pre-stressed concrete, or asbestos cement. While it's only 10%, uh, those other types of pipe represent very significant challenges to the water utility industry. Their, expect their life expectancy is far less than the uh, cast iron and ductile iron. 20% of that infrastructure is older than 100 years old. We have uh, pipes dating back to the 1870s, and they're essentially at the end of their useful life. Another 10% uh, are nine miles, or 900 miles, is between 80 and 100 years old, and therefore it's approaching the end of its, its useful life, you know, really within the next, next few years. So I talk about pipe age. Pipe age is a good proxy for long-range planning and order of magnitude estimates. Uh, but reality, you know, an effective infrastructure uh, replacement program has to look at m many more specific factors. This is really where the asset management uh, discussion comes in. You need to look at the physical condition of the pipe. You need to look at the performance that the pipe is, is providing, the hydraulic capacity, the fire flow capacity that, that, that is provided. We're all kind of used to seeing the, uh, uh, the press that's around catastrophic main breaks and the disruption that that provides. You know, but that's really only the tip of the iceberg on this problem. When infrastructure starts to age, uh, the, you know, the problems that it presents are, are much less obvious. You start to get uh, reduction in flow capacity. You start to get difficulties in water quality because of a buildup of corrosion deposits, sediment and so forth called tuberculation. It becomes harder to carry a disinfectant residual across your system. Well, a disinfectant residual is arguably the single most important uh, water quality parameter uh, protecting public health. So it becomes a significant challenge. And we've talked about the, leak, the leakage, issue. leakage issue. Clearly, on average, 20% of the water we produce uh, leaks out of our pipes. In a good system, that's as small as 5%. But there are systems around the state that are more than 40, have more than 45% lost water due to, due to aging infrastructure. So what's the, you know, what's the solution? And let me talk about that. From a, from a utility standpoint, some people ask, well, what's a good metric? What can you use just to measure at a high level? I ask a simple question. What's your rate of planned infrastructure replacement? For many utilities, that is zero. They have a completely reactive program. It's a break-fix program, which is not only the most expensive, but it's the most disruptive. A, probably a leading utility is replacing its infrastructure on a planned basis about 1% a year. So that's about a 100-year cycle. But the average across the industry is about a quarter to a half percent of infrastructure renewal, which translates to about a 200 to 400 year cycle to replace infrastructure. And let's face it, pipes don't, pipes don't last that long. So we need to, uh, we really need to move. Uh, from a utility standpoint, we need to do our part. Uh, we've talked about asset management, effective life cycle asset management. When your needs exceed your resources, you've got to essentially squeeze out any in inefficiency in your end-to-end -end process, not only your asset management processes, but your operations uh, processes. Let me give you an example of, of, a thing, of something that American Water has done. We invest annually 900 to a billion dollars in, in water infrastructure every year. Uh, about half of that, maybe 500 million, is for buried infrastructure. We've implemented a national, regional, and local procurement process that logically groups all of our materials and installation needs for that work uh, into very attractive procurement bundles that allow us to go out uh, uh, to the market and drive very significant uh, purchasing cost savings. And that's just one example of how we're trying to stretch our investment dollar uh, to, meet, to meet the infrastructure needs. Um, the other area is yeah, long-range planning, systematic and recurring approach to infrastructure renewal. A start-stop process, whether it's driven by funding or otherwise, is very inefficient. Worse yet is a wait and see, is a wait and see approach. The cost is only going to get uh, higher as we go forward. You're going to increase the, really, the steepness of the investment curve. And at the same time, your, your resiliency and your level of service is going to decline. And ultimately, you're going to end up with rate shock. So you really need to start with really a systematic approach. How do you get there? Progressive regulatory uh, regimes that incentivize utilities to make these investments are important. The New Jersey Board of Public Utilities did just that a year ago by implementing the regulatory mechanism called uh, DISIC or Distribution System Improvement Charge. 
it, it, it provides a, a vehicle for utilities uh, to invest between base rate cases on targeted investments around infrastructure renewals. There are checks and balances in the program. There's a 5% cap. The surcharge can't exceed 5% before we go in within a three-year time frame and make a, and make a, a true up filing. Uh, in fact, you know, today's meeting is, is timely. We, we will be delivering our first filing under that program today, uh, seeking to recover $45 million of targeted infrastructure renewal expense uh, that's taken place over the past seven months. Um, so that addresses, you know, the 40 percent of the investor-owned utilities that Michelle mentioned. How do, you, how do we deal with, with the balance of the utilities in the state? Well, I think for all utilities, what's known as full cost of service pricing uh, is essential. You know, no matter how unpopular it is, if utilities have a rate structure that simply recovers their annual operating expenses and it doesn't reflect the cost of ongoing maintenance and investment in infrastructure, those are false rates. And, and really, they reflect a lack of understanding and a lack of leadership by, by those that are responsible for the long-term sustainability of those, those communities. You know, water rates differ all over the state depending on usage, depending on tariffs and so forth. But on average, a residential water bill in the state of New Jersey is about $50 a month. Over the next 20 years, as we continue to make the, the needed investment, that, that bill could increase, it could double. It could be $100 a month in the next uh, 20 years. What that identifies is that water utilities need to now also start, start to be more proactive in terms of our low income assistance programs. As the cost for utility service rises, there is going to be you know, a, uh, a segment of the population where that presents an affordability issue. And I think the electric and gas utilities are way ahead of us in this area. And I think we can take a page from their book to make sure that we're taking care of those customers where affordability is an issue. And so I'll, I'll stop there and just say that you know, whether it was Hurricane Sandy or other drivers, this is our crucible moment. Now is the time to take action, to mobilize our resource, and to get ahead of it. I think the good news is the solution can be implemented in a systematic way over a long term that really minimizes any unintended economic consequences and certainly minimizes rate shock. To do nothing, though, does just the opposite. We're just setting ourselves up for rate shock. We're, we're, we're going to incur significant economic impacts, and at the same time, we're not going to have the the uh, resiliency and the service that we need uh, to be successful as a as a uh, as a state. So thanks, and I'll stop there. Thanks, Steve, and thank to all the panelists. They did a great job in uh, uh, presenting a very sober subject. Uh, Michelle, um, given. Uh, the, what Bob talked about, the gap between uh, the money coming in and what needs to be spent. Um, is the department prioritizing what projects need to move forward first? And is there a bigger uh, focus on drinking water supplies than wastewater? So earlier when I talked about comprehensive water resource management, the way we're looking to approach water in the state of New Jersey is by looking in our different watersheds and prioritizing our watersheds based upon uh, needs, need assessment, stressors in that region, water quality, quantity, et cetera. So yes, we are, we are prioritizing. We've actually been going through a matrix type process where we've been um, identifying different stressors and opportunities in all of our different watersheds. And our goal going forward is to try and put our limited people resource and financial resource in those areas most stressed in order to, you know, have some good iterative um, pro progress. Okay. <clears throat> and you also mentioned about hardening uh, the infrastructure around the wastewater and water facilities. In studying this issue, are you accounting for sea, sea level rise in the future because of climate change? So we're, we're definitely taking into consideration, you know, impact of weather events. I mean, that's, that's what we've been experiencing over the past few years. Um, you know, Steve said that he was going to be more optimistic, but I was more depressed after the first five minutes because he reminded me of what we've experienced just in the last three years of this administration. And um, we do. So when we talk about resiliency, we're not just planning to 
one event we're planning to, you know, what we're being told is, is the future. Sea level rise relative to all of our uh, coastal and, and tidal communities is extremely important. And when we talk about elevation and, you know, FEMA's new maps are, are due out and their, their base flood elevations, you know, that takes into consideration certain factors and then how do we also plan on top of that for even more extreme situations. But we have to balance that. I mean, we can't, we, we can't expect that everybody is going to be prepared at every moment of every day for the 500-year flood. That's going to be wholly impractical, and so that's where the balancing act comes in to make sure that we're the most resilient we can be, but in an affordable manner at the same time. Okay, uh, Bob, um, in, your, in your study uh, facing our future, did you guys look at potential sources of revenue to address uh, these, uh, I know I think you did on the, uh, gas uh, transportation side, but did you look at anything on the water side? Yeah, I, I, I think we did on uh, on all sides, uh, on the, uh, on, uh, except for electricity. Uh, in electricity, we, we simply said that it was probably time for the role of BPU to change <coughs> and, and to become more active in terms of long-range planning rather than visiting people just on a rate case basis. So we think BPU should be strengthened and their role ought to be strengthened. In terms of transportation, uh, we suggested that uh, it, it, it's way past time that we addressed uh, revenue sources. Uh, we are third lowest gas tax in the country right now. Uh, there are other states, and, and in the short term, we have to do something with the gas tax. Now. I say in the short term because in the long term, that's not the solution. Other states are looking at other solutions. Virginia has just made an aggressive move and has, has attached uh, their, their uh, sales tax to petroleum products, which of course has the added advantage of having an inflationary factory built in. It's also easier for, for whatever reason, it's easier for legislatures to deal with sales tax increases than it is with anything else. Uh, and, and progressive states like Oregon are looking at vehicle miles traveled as, as a way to attack uh, the long-range future of transportation funding. And in water supply, we've said people have to, the, the rates have to go up. I mean, there's a source there, there are rate payers there, they, they get a tremendous product, a fundamentally important product, and they have to pay for that, that right. And that extends to uh, watershed management. You know, New York is spending $1 billion on watershed protection. And in doing so, they're saving, in the long run, $5 billion in plant upgrades and new plants. You know, that, that's pretty progressive. That, that's intelligent spending. And, and I think that's what we're suggesting across the line. These are, first of all, all these things are fundamental to, to, the, to the economic development potential of the state of New Jersey and to our well-being in every other way. And we have to, we have to face the fact that to, to have them, we have to pay for them. Now, um, one of my good friends is in the audience, Jim Florio, uh, and, and you know, partially he's responsible for, I guess, the last 20 years because he was the last one that said, if you're gonna spend it, you have to raise it. Uh, now, I happen to think that Jim looks a lot better in the rearview mirror to a lot of people because it, he did raise it. He made it happen. And, and, he, and, and in doing so, he displayed tremendous courage. And what I'm saying is that, and, and this is, there's no blame here. It's not this administration, that administration. It's been a lot of administrations and a lot of, a lot of public officials. You can't promise something unless you can provide something. You can't provide something unless you pay for something. And so, given all the good plans, and I think we need all these plans, again, to make sure that we're spending our money in a, in a, on the right priorities. But getting past the planning process, you have to be prepared to pay for it. Okay, thank you. Rick, um, <clears throat> Steve talked about the discharge that was uh, enacted last year um, to help water utilities expedite investment in their infrastructure. Would that work on the wastewater treatment side? Or it doesn't work because the, the, most of them are publicly owned? Not well, the, the, the concept could work for the public sector as well as it's 
being enacted on the private sector. It hasn't been discussed, and actually I was talking about something that went the other way, uh, is being discussed. So uh, that concept could work very well for both uh, um, municipal and county and regional facilities, both wastewater and water. Would it put a dent in a $37 billion need? Well, I don't, it, it would make a dent in it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Steve, uh, you said water rates may have to double in the next uh, 20 years. 20 years. Um, what's that going to do to the state's economy? You know, I guess I, I can't speak to the state's economy. The, the discussion about water rates is a very local, local issue. The American Water Works Association report that I mentioned, buried no longer, really does a nice job discussing the fact that while maybe on average they double, smaller communities probably are going to bear a, a far larger burden of that rate increase because they just don't have the base uh, to spread those, those costs over. When you implement an infrastructure replacement program, like a lot of things, they're, they're kind of fixed costs associated with standing up an asset management. In, in launching a program like that, and then the variable costs obviously start to relate to the size of the utility. When those fixed costs have to be really carried by a very small customer base, uh, really the smaller systems are going to bear the, the, the bigger impact of those rates, probably more so than the larger, uh, you know, the larger communities or the larger systems. The state has been trying to consolidate the smaller systems, but it hasn't really happened to the extent that some people thought, is this going to just uh, uh, going to force it to happen in the next Well, I, th decade. I think it will certainly become a stronger driver as, as these smaller systems are, are, are faced with the need to make the investment simply because their infrastructure is failing. You know, we've gotten away with it uh, up to this point, but uh, I, I think the time is coming now where we just can't continue the do-nothing approach or the reactive approach. Uh, you know, and I think we're working on things with uh, legislature with the uh, New Jersey Board of Public Utilities to give these smaller systems more options, N not mandates to sell, but kind of making it economically feasible if they want to get out of the business that, that they can do so. Okay. Michelle, uh, Bob mentioned, in, and it's cited in the Facing Our Future report, that uh, the water supply man ma management plan hasn't been done uh, in many years. Well, where, what's the status of the plan? So um, we actually, over the last two years, were uh, working very fastidiously on the plan, and um, a lot of work has been done. In fact, a lot of the data is already um, on our website in many different fashions. It's just not put together in terms of a policy statement for how we go forward. Um, at this point, a draft plan is complete. Um, it is awaiting the opportunity for the state strategic plan because those two really go hand in hand. So yeah, but that's sort of been put on hold, too, in the wake of Sandy. When's that coming out? I, I, I'm not responsible for the delivery of that plan, so I, I can't tell you when it will come out. But your statement is very apropos in that Sandy, unfortunately, has delayed a lot of things because our, while our focus gets shifted, what we've been doing, I, I would say we're working under a lot of the principles of the draft state strategic plan, and we rely upon a lot of the data of the water supply plan to help inform us in the post-Sandy build. Okay. Uh, we usually uh, allow uh, the audience members an opportunity to ask questions if uh, anybody has a question. Okay. Um, this question is for Robert. Um, I'd like, could you elaborate a little bit on the role that you would like to see on uh, VPU? Uh, I, I think. I, I, uh, the question was uh, elaborate on the role uh, for BPU and how it could be strengthened. Yeah, this, this came really out of the uh, electricity portion of our, our report. And what, what we said was that, that there's got to be more proactive planning at the state level. And the logical place to do that is at BPU. Um, and by proactive planning, you know, planning in resiliency, planning in redundancy, looking at things that are not, maybe, maybe not reflected immediately in rates, but look at 15 years or 10 years. And BPU is, is stressed as it is. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's an organization that's got smaller and smaller, uh, thanks to companies that keep hiring professionals from BPU. But, <laughs> but, 
The fact of the matter is that we think that, that there is a proactive role that BPU can take. In addition to setting rates, in addition to those types of hearings, that if we're going to plan well, then the state has to be a part of that planning process. And if that's the case, then the logical place to do it is BPU. That, so that, that was the position we took. Tom, I may sure. maybe offer a perspective as well as a, as a regulated utility. So first of all, it wasn't us that hired that. It was another similarly named utility, but not us. Um, you know, what I would say is, you know, the, rate, the traditional rate making process, you know, by design is an adversarial process. So you have to find new ways to work with BPU in a collaborative partnership in an industry. And we would welcome, you know, what Bob and his, his colleagues have recommended in the, you know, facing our future report so that we could, you know, start a process of, of a more collaborative dialogue. And maybe you do, you know, you have to do it outside of the rate making process. But I think it would be a very, very effective. And I think the other water utilities in the state would agree, really open up a, a valuable dialogue. Well, Bob, we got a, uh, Steve, we got a, another question for you. Are there increasing trends towards storage, uh, similar to uh, electricity, uh, in the water systems as a cost-effective way? Resilient. The answer is yes, but pro probably not in, not in in in, a, in in as big a way as, as you might think. There, I mean, there are you know standards that we follow today about what the required storage is in a water system. You know. A perfect water system ought to have at least you know one to two days of, of storage for their system. When you start to build additional storage, you know water age, water quality starts to become a concern. So it becomes a, you know a bit of an operational balance that you have to strike. So while there are you know we have some storage projects in, in our long range plan, I, I wouldn't say it's overly significant in terms of our our long range planning. Mm -hmm. One of the things the uh, the last water supply master plan talked about was uh, potential deficits in certain parts of the state. Michelle, can you give us a preview of the plan and is the deficit situation getting worse or is it getting better? I think it was in South Jersey in parts of northern New Jersey. Yeah, I mean, what I would say is that um, we, we are on safe ground for uh, the next decade plus. The key is that we have to continue to work on our interconnected systems in the state. So while we see certain areas um, we might be going into a supply issue, the key is creating new connections to those areas for flow. And that becomes back to that part of asset management resiliency. A lot of the projects we're looking on for resiliency around the state and projects we're trying to get funded are interconnections, new interconnections to move where we have an abundance of water to areas where we may have less water. Will we need to build new reservoir, reservoir systems? That is, that right now, that is not what we're, what we're seeing. We're seeing um, rather other strategies. And in South Jersey, particularly, where we have some um, salt intrusion issues, it may be more about treatment. But again, I think the key for the state's resiliency right now is better interconnection, because we have some areas where we're very flush with water. hate to use those puns. But um, we need to be able to move them when we need, have a need somewhere else. So I can add some context. Sure. Uh, Monmouth County, and we've been very public about it, is one of those water-stressed areas in the state, and we've looked at reservoirs, we've looked at desal, we've looked at a, a variety of options, and what Michelle mentions is correct. We, we really think the most cost-effective solution there is to get some interconnection with other basins. That becomes very re a regulatory challenge, and can be, but it really is how do we use the resources in the state more effectively? Because uh, the, the water is there. We're a water-rich state. We just need to be able to move it around a little better. Will climate change uh, improve the water situation in New Jersey or make it worse? I think time without action will make it worse. I think with long-range planning, good systematic investments, I, I think we're, we're really positioned uh, to do well. On the drinking water side, I think the wastewater challenges are more significant. I think the, there's probably been more underinvestment in that, in that sector. Okay. Uh, okay, another question from the audience. Um, they want uh, you to elaborate on the hardening of the infrastructure needs to be coordinated with smart growth. Is it being done? And if it is, and why not? Want to try it, Michelle? Sure. Um, yeah, so the, the hardening of asset and, and smart growth, absolutely. I, I think that's where I was starting to go before. We have to be careful about what the unintended consequence of an action is. And so while a, a flood wall might be right in one place, we have to look at how that impacts the region around that in terms of, you know, other water flow. Um, so 
we're very, very in tune, and I started talking about green infrastructure, and that is a um, tremendous part of our strategies in rebuild, particularly in our CSO communities. We issued our first draft permit down in the Camden region for uh, CSOs going forward, and within that, you can see, and it's on our website, so it'll give you a sense of the direction we're going for CSO communities, which is a big challenge and very expensive, and again, that's combined sewer overflow for anyone who doesn't know. Um, green infrastructure is written into the, the draft permit, and we are asking that there be green infrastructure as part of their strategy in the first five years, the first permit cycle of that. And we have on our website a very robust um, set of information on green infrastructure and good opportunities around green infrastructure. Uh, talking about uh, hardening and flood walls, uh, has the permit, I, I know it just came out, but Mayor Bloomberg, uh, proposed a pretty ambitious plan to uh, harden New York City. Uh, what kind of impact will it have on New Jersey? So I, again, I think that's part and parcel of our, of our strategies. And the one distinction I always draw is that New York City is one, it's one system and it's one regulator. When you come into the state of New Jersey, we are hundreds of interconnected systems. And in order for us to address just one issue, and a, a very easy example for me to give is Middlesex County Utility Authority and that issue I was talking about earlier with infiltration and inflow, so leaky pipes. In order for us to address the, the trunk line that comes into the MCUA pump station, we need about 10 different municipalities and players at the table at all different levels, municipal level, county level, and then the treatment work itself. So it's a little more challenging, but this is how we are approaching this. Um, what we're trying to do is go into a region, we sit with an MCUA and try and bring the players around the table that stress and impact that facility. This is where I come back to that whole idea of looking at stressors. And that is another part of smart growth is, we, when we talk about hardening assets, we can't just talk about the structure itself, you know, the box and what we're gonna do to it to tighten it up. We have to talk about what's coming into that system and we have to try to limit what's coming into that system. And there's also a part nobody's touched on, which is water conservation. You know, I think as a, as a state, when I came from my energy hat to my water hat, the first thing I said is, you know, in energy it took us decades, but we know to turn off a light when we leave a room and, you know, turn off a computer and unplug things. In the water world, just keep turning on that faucet, just keep watering that lawn, just keep washing that car. We do not think about it. It's, it's a commodity we, we have to get smarter about on a conservation side. What can the state do? To, I mean, it's sort of like driving. People don't like uh, to be told how they're going to use well, their it's water. Be it's behavior, but you influence behavior through education. So we have an awful lot of outreach opportunities um, at DEP. We have our watershed ambassadors that go out all along our 20 um, watersheds around the state, do massive amounts of, of education. We have tools on our website. Uh, we're out in the public all the time. And, and then we have to incorporate it into, into some of the ways when we can, when we have authority to, to take measures. Okay. We don't have to go alone on that one because we can look to cities like Atlanta, Las Vegas, all the communities in California, that in Arizona, and the, that have been forced, you know, into to obviously more progressive water conservation programs. You know, whether they're regulatory, whether they're through some rate mechanism, there's there's a lot of good examples out there of, of successes on water conservation. Okay. Uh, another particular audience member asked, is it true that 23 billion gallons of raw wastewater flow into the Hudson and Passaic River annually? Uh, that sounds like a lot. Is it? No. And is it caused by flooding, or what is the reason for it? No, I, uh, annually, I thought that was going to be a post-Sandy question. I was going to say, sadly, that number is, is true and maybe even a little light, but um, annually, no, uh, we, I mean, we don't measure the raw sewage flow on an annual basis, but our treatment facilities do a fabulous job. Where we do have an issue is those combined sewer overflows, and we do have combined sewer overflows in a heavy storm where the water diverts from the, the treatment facility and goes out into the Hudson or other water bodies. So that's the time that you have that, but we continuously monitor those areas where we have outfalls, and we make sure that the water quality is meeting the standards that it is supposed to. So. While there is, at points in time, flow that occurs, it is flow because of the type of infrastructure that was created many, many years ago that was, quite frankly, a best management practice. When that water goes, one thing we learned in Sandy, and, and this is, again, the things we don't think about, we're trying to alleviate combined sewer overflow. We don't want discharge going into our water bodies, right? It's bad, we don't want it. 
During Sandy, the fact that we had CSOs kept that raw sewage out of, our munici out of our local municipalities, out of the basements of people's homes, because it was able to put it out into the water where it would quickly dilute. Rick, uh, so what happened to the sludge during Sandy? Well, what the, the major impact was that the Passaic Valley uh, plant was down and inaccessible uh, for, for weeks and, and months. And so a good bit of uh, uh, New Jersey's sludge uh, went there for treatment. And the other facilities either could not accept them because they were having their own problems, like the ACUA. We can't accept outside sludge, but we're an island, uh, you know, in an area. So it was inaccessible. And, that, and the other place is the institutional arrangement, uh, the, the, the deal, uh, the ability to charge and accept and the, the physical uh, part of receiving sludge in, in trucks or, or tanker trucks. Uh, just wasn't in place or to ship it, to transport it. Uh, the, the department is working on this. We've had a couple of uh, task force that I've participated in and others uh, that Michelle's department has uh, facilitated. But what it has brought forth is that really we, we have a problem uh, on the long term anyway uh, that hasn't been addressed and, and focused on in a while. Uh, so uh, that's that's the problem. So there, there are a lot of little things that can be done to improve things, and that normally does happen after a major event, but then there's some long-term, and there's some technology issues and, and, and developing technologies that need to be studied and uh, you know, tried out. You, uh, <coughs> you guys are involved. Can I just add to that? Because sure. I, I don't want to leave a perception that there was unattended sludge post-Sandy because there wasn't. We were very fortunate that we were able to divert to areas up in North Jersey that could handle it. But the other part of it is we had to call our industrial users and ask them to hold up their operations. That was very, very challenging. When, when you're calling, think about the Newark area and think about the large industrial institutions there. And when you're calling Anheuser-Busch and Newark Airport and you're saying, can you lighten up the load, that's not an easy thing to do. But everyone worked together tremendously and we did not have any unattended sludge. Rick, uh, talking about sludge, your facility is involved in an interesting uh, pilot project. Uh, I think it's called hydrothermal. Could you talk well, about that? The, the, uh, ACUA is entertaining two uh, pilot projects. One is plasma gasification, and the other one is the uh, delta thermal hydrothermal uh, project. Uh, as possible um, future technologies to be used both for sludge uh, disposal and extracting energy from sludge and also um, solid waste. Mm -hmm. You haven't gotten, to, you look, you're looking at the two proposals. Uh, the, they're both uh, kind of um, moving their way through the process of DP consideration and the economics and regulatory issues. Steve, um, how does the replacement of infrastructure get coordinated with smart growth? You know, we've, our, our planning process, and, and Michelle talked about it a little bit, um, you know, planning process in, in the typical water utility focuses a little bit more short term. Maybe it looks at a five-year window. You might s stretch it out. And it tends to be focused on, I'll call the gray infrastructure, the pipes and pumps. Uh, about two years ago, we, we've expanded our planning process to what we call, it's integrated water resources management where we're really trying to take a, a watershed-based approach, uh, involve the, um, really the key stakeholders to all the water resources in that area, including the planning departments, to do really a better job uh, in our long-range planning on both the green and the gray infrastructure. And that includes, uh, you know, smart growth, low-impact development, where those, you know, where those things can be brought to bear. I, I will say, though, Tom, it's, it's at its infancy right now. It, it really... You know, we're, we're doing the outreach to try to kind of build these coalitions. Um, I, I think more work could be done there at all levels to help, to help build those coalitions of the, the long-range plan. I guess part of that is the adoption of the strategic investment point, which tries to sure. better this. manage growth in New Jersey. So it would be nice to see that come to fruition. Uh, we have a pretty tight... Uh, time frame today, so I think that'll be it. But I just wanted to thank our panelists for giving the great uh, the discussion. And thank you all.
We hope you enjoyed this program. For more information, visit njspotlight.com. We produce this program in the studios of Lubetkin Global Communications in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, on the web at lubetkin.net. For everyone at NJ Spotlight, this is Steve Lubetkin. Thank you for joining us and take good care. NJ Spotlight, where issues matter.